from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Don't clap for me, I'm a book reviewer. <laughs> People denounce me and curse me and threaten me. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Last year I introduced Ken Follett and we looked sort of alike. We were both wearing similar coats and after it was over I was standing out there and people started coming up to me and saying, can I have your autograph and can I take your photograph? And I should have said, you know, I charge $10 for my autograph. <laughs> In any event, I'm still Patrick Anderson, and I'm still, we're still proud to be part of this great event and, for, and delighted that all of you are here. Uh, there are a lot of lawyers writing novels these days, uh, but very few of them have been more determined or more successful than our ne next speaker, Steve Berry. In 1990, Steve was in his mid-30s. He was a practicing lawyer in Georgia, and he started trying to write fiction, trying to write a novel. It took him 12 years and 85 rejections before he finally sold his first historical thriller, The Amber Room, to Ballantine Books for publication in 2003. Since then, he's never looked back. He's had another nine novels published, I believe that's in eight years, all by Ballantine. His novels include the seven bestsellers in the Cotton Malone series, which began with The Templar Legacy in 2006. All told, he has 12 million books in print in 40 languages. I might add that Steve credits the nuns in the Catholic schools he attended with teaching him the discipline he needed both to write his novels and to get them published. If there are any unpublished agnostics out there, you should give this some thought. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to introduce Steve Berry. Pretty amazing for me to be here on the National Mall with the Capitol there and at the National Book Festival. I've watched this on television for years. I always wanted to come and finally I got the call last year and they actually invited me to come. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I want to talk to you just a few minutes about how I got from St. Augustine, Florida to here, which is, which is not, lift the microphone up, all right? How about that, better? All right. Uh, how I got from St. Augustine to here, and it wasn't coming up on an airplane. Uh, it was a kind of a long journey. Patrick told you a little bit about it, but I was going to tell you a little bit more. And then uh, take some questions. I love questions. So uh, if you have anything to ask, don't be bashful. I like, uh, I like you to ask away. Um, for me, um, it started really kind of weird. Uh, every writer I've ever met in my life has a little voice in their head. They have a little voice that tells them to write. And it doesn't say write a bestseller or make a movie or anything like that. It just says sit down and write. If you sit down and write, the little voice will hush. If you don't write, the little voice drives you up a wall. And it does. It, and every writer I've met, I've talked to a, a many, many of them, and they all tell me the same thing. And for me, I had a little voice in my head for 10 years. It drove me up a wall. I didn't know what to do about it. Finally, one day in the summer of 1990, I sat down and I wrote a book. It took me a year to write that book. When I got done, it was the most horrible thing you've ever read in your entire life. It's that tall. It's 170,000 words, which tells you how bad it truly is uh, right off the bat. But there was something about that manuscript that is really amazing and that will always be with me for all my life, and that is that I finished it. I actually started it and I finished it. You can't imagine how many writers don't finish something. Uh, in our History Matters Foundation, we teach writing all over the country and we try to encourage people not to quit, don't quit. Well, I didn't quit at least, but it was still horrible. So what do you do? You write another book. I did, I wrote another one. It was horrible too. It was shorter though, it was only like 140,000 words. It was still bad. Uh, by the way, I was writing those like a lawyer. You know how lawyers write? You say it over and over and over till it's true. Just keep saying it enough till it's true. The object of fiction is to say it once. Those are both very hard to do, but you don't want to mix them, okay? Don't do that, and that's what I was doing. Third book I wrote was uh, 120,000 words, still kind of big, but, uh, and it wasn't horrible, it was just bad. 
and I figured out that writing novels is very hard. It's not easy. There's nothing easy about it. I was really kind of cocky about it and thought it was a lot simpler than it was. So I went down to Jacksonville, Florida. I got myself into a writer's group at a creative uh, writing workshop, and I went every Wednesday night for six years. And I took my chapter. Anybody ever been to a writer's group? You know what I'm talking about? Aren't they lovely people? You take it, you read it out loud, and they destroy it. That's new. There's not a kind word spoken in the whole place. But there's a method to the madness, because 75% of what you hear in a writer's group is pure garbage. You never want to remember it. But 25% of what you hear is gold, absolute gold. Now, how do you know the difference? Time teaches you the difference. It took me about three years to begin to weed the gold from the garbage. And after a while, you begin to teach yourself the craft of writing, and that's what I did. And I wrote a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth novel. I was lucky to get an agent, thrilled actually, it was amazing, because it's harder to get an agent than to get a publisher. And uh, she submitted those manuscripts, they were rejected 85 times. So you may wonder, how did I get here? What happened? <laughs> I caught a break one day. Every once in a while, if you hang in there long enough, and you stick with it long enough, and you just persevere long enough, it's cliche, but it's true, luck will fall your way. And what happened for me is the world changed. In 1990, the thriller genre died. When the Soviet Union fell and the Berlin Wall crumbled, that was the end of the spy thriller. It was gone. Now, if you were Follett or Ludlum or Kussler, or those folks, you were fine. You had an audience, you were in good shape. But if you were Steve Berry trying to break in, you can forget it. There was nobody buying those books. They just were dead and gone. And by the mid-90s, the genre was buried. And by 2000, it was nearly forgotten. And then one day, something happened. Random House, at Doubleday, a division of Random House, bought a book from a relatively unknown writer. His first three books were not all that successful, but his fourth book was something a little different, and they had high hopes for it. They thought they really had something there that might change things. Every once in a while, a book comes along that changes things, and it was The Da Vinci Code. And they bought it. They sent it out to the bookstores, the book reps. Everyone looked at it and said, you know, this is a little different. It's action, history, secrets, conspiracy, international settings. Guess what I was writing? <laughs> <laughs> so they bought the Da Vinci Code, and they were looking for stuff to go with it. Now, this is a year before Da Vinci's published, so no one had an I any idea what was going to happen at this point. But they thought they had something interesting. And I got bought, the Amber Room got bought the second time around and made it in. And then, of course, you know what happened. Da Vinci was published. It went to number one. It stayed in the top ten on the New York Times bestseller list for the next three years and it reignited the genre. It brought the international suspense thriller genre back to life. And I got a break, and a lot of other writers did too. And that is why until the, to this day, when I go into a bookstore and I pass a Da Vinci Code, I stop and I bow. <laughs> Always. You must pay homage to the Da Vinci. I, I would not be here. There's a lot of others that won't be here. Now, will that become, you know, will that be remembered as one of the largest selling fiction books of all time? Probably. But I think it will also be remembered for a book that brought a genre back to life and, re and, it, and introduced you to a lot of writers you would have never seen and never got a chance to do. And that, I think, will be Da Vinci's greatest legacy. I was lucky that The Amber Room, The Romanoff Prophecy, and The Third Secret was three of the five that got rejected. So they got bought the second time around and made it to print. The others didn't, but I've stolen from all of those through books, and about 80% of the words in those books have appeared in all the other novels. So I've used about every word that I've ever written, so any of you writers out there, please do not throw your words away. You can actually use those uh, with some changes, but you can use them. And I was fortunate that Da Vinci did as well as it did, because Amber Room got a good push from that. Romanoff did a little better. Third Secret did a little better. And then along came The Templar Legacy, which was my breakout book. For Dan, it was his fourth book. For me, it was my fourth book. Now, I didn't quite have the success he had uh, to do, but Da Vinci, uh, I mean, uh, Templar Legacy introduced Cotton Malone. Retired Justice Department operative, lives in Copenhagen, runs an old bookshop, gets himself in trouble all the time. A lot like his creator. 
he was modeled after me, and uh, there's a lot of my personality in him. And Cotton always deals with something lost from the past, something gone, something forgotten, something you may know very little about, but which you want to know more about. And so we, we go on this quest for this thing, but this thing still has great relevance today. I've dealt with the Lost Library of Alexandria, the Lost Tomb of Alexander the Great, Charlemagne, uh, Napoleon, uh, the first uh, emperor's to, uh, uh, tomb in China, and in the newest hardcover that's out now, uh, the United States Constitution in the Jefferson Key. Um, so Cotton has been around for a little while. He's had a, he's had a great run. Uh, he did, though, call me on the phone a few months ago. He was a little bit upset with me. He's been a little angry with me lately because all I've been doing is kind of blowing up his bookshop, <laughs> causing him problems. He says he can't get any liability insurance. No employees will work for him. His business is gone. He, does, he just says, please, would you leave me alone for a year and let me have a vacation? So uh, Cotton's going to take a year off next year. And I'm going to write a standalone for the first time in 10 years. It's an interesting character. He's a disgraced newspaper reporter, and he's coming. Uh, I've created a, a new world. It's not a Cotton Malone kind of character, but it's a Cotton Malone kind of story. It's still action, history, secrets, conspiracy, international settings. And it will deal with something very interesting with Christopher Columbus, who's a very fascinating individual that we know almost nothing about. We know zero about this man. Uh, to do. So this thriller is going to do, it's called The Columbus Affair, it'll be out next May, and then Cotton's going to come back in 2013 with a uh, thriller dealing with his young son Gary uh, that's going to take place in England. So at least I have some stories for the next couple of years after that, I really have no idea. <laughs> I'm a little concerned about that, but uh, uh, it'll come eventually, I hope. Uh, I've got about another six months to figure that out, but it'll, it'll come to do. It's been kind of interesting for me because that's kind of how I got from St. Augustine to here. It's been a 20-year journey, 12 of which was unpublished. I have to kind of pinch myself sometimes, you know, because, you know, about nine years ago, I couldn't give away a book. I couldn't say, here's a manuscript. Please just take it. I'll let you have it for free. And uh, now we're in 50 countries around the world. It's kind of amazing. Only in America could that happen. It's truly, it's truly in incredible that, that it can be done. And now I get to do it for a living. I used to practice law. I was a divorce lawyer for 30 years. Isn't that fun? <laughs> That's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you talk about fun. I've heard it all. There's nothing you could tell me that I haven't heard. I did thousands of divorces. So, um, but I don't do that anymore, thank goodness. Uh, my time's over to do. I tell writers all the time, write what you know is horrible advice. Do not write what you know. Write what you love. If what you know and what you love are the same thing, wonderful. But if it isn't, don't do it. Uh, I know all about divorces. I know how to try people for murder. I've done all of that. I don't want to write about it. I enjoy action, history, secrets, and conspiracies in international settings. That's what I like to read, so that's what I gravitated towards. So that's what I came to tell you. Let's see what's on your mind. What kind of questions would you like to ask? What would you like to ask me? Yes, sir. And I'll repeat it so everybody will hear it. Oh, you got a mic. Oh, you, no, I didn't know that. It's fancy I see. here. Um, <laughs> as uh, somebody who's been to one of your writer's workshops, um, and it's, uh, it's done a lot for me, could you please tell the audience a little bit more about yours and your wife's Elizabeth's nonprofit, History Matters? Sure. Because I think by you going across the country and doing things for the community, the local communities, it means a lot. It means a it means a lot to the communities, it means a lot to the people. Thank so you, if you thank could explain a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, History Matters is a foundation that Elizabeth and I created a couple of years ago. We were traveling all over the country and we kept seeing no money for historic preservation. I was a county commissioner for 12 years, so I know there's no public money for historic preservation out there at all. It's very tough. So we came up with a way to raise money. So it's an interesting, unique way. What I do is uh, we just did this in... Um, well, the workshop that you attended was in Raleigh. The, uh, the historic cemetery up there had some damage done up there in a tornado that came through. It's a very old historic cemetery. Trees had fallen over. They had no money to clean it up, basically, and put it back like it was. So what we do is we come into a community. We put on a writer's workshop. You buy your way in with a contribution somewhere between $80 and $100. Every dime of that goes to the project. We don't charge to come. We don't charge expenses. I pay for all that out of my pocket. That day, we raised a few thousand dollars. It was enough to help clean up that cemetery there to do. 
So it, we've done uh, nine of these around the country. We've raised around $75,000. I've taught about 850 students. And what I do is in four hours, I teach you what I learned in 12 years. <laughs> it's really, it's a crash course, obviously. But it's enough to get you thinking so that when you go back home and you start looking at your craft, you can work on it. Because there's, see, there's no one in the world that can teach anybody how to write. There's no such thing as a writing teacher. It doesn't exist. But there are people who can help teach you how to teach you how to write. And that's how it works. And I try to be that for them in those four hours uh, to do. So we do that and we're planning, we have six more for next year and we're looking at some for 2013. So if anybody out there has a project, go to my website, steveberry.org and send us a, an email and we'll see if we can come and help you out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My husband and I love your books. What I want to know is, <clears throat> we enjoy them a lot, not only for the mystery thriller aspect, but for the fact that they're in foreign countries and they're places that we've seen, mm -hmm. and they bring back memories. Have you been to these places, or do you just do a lot of research? Well, no, I actually go, there's only two spots I've never gone to that I wrote about, and that was China and Antarctica. And I couldn't, I just couldn't get to either one of them. It just takes a long time to get there. But all the other spaces, places I've, I've, I've pretty much have been to, yes, uh, and have been to and, and experienced. There's only just a few little secondary places, but the primary locations. For the Columbus book, we went to Prague and we went to Jamaica. There's actually a connection, by the way, between Prague and Jamaica. That'll get you thinking, won't it? What, what, what connects those two up? Uh, but there's a... We actually go there and we do our research there and, uh, and, and put them together. So I try to do that. I want you to learn something in the books. Primarily, I'm there to entertain you. And my novel is to entertain. But if you can learn something along the way, that's great. I mean, because I do. I know I do, so I hope you do too. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you know uh, how much of your research to uh, put into your books, which is done so well, um, and to actually get into your writing your own story and not put in maybe just too much research, but as I say, yours is, is very well done. How do you know that? Well, it's, it's, it's a constant struggle. It's mixing information with action is the constant struggle in my genre. What's too much and what's not enough? And practice, I try to get it, I try to find that balance as best I can. I have uh, my agent, my editor, Elizabeth, they're all pretty tough on me on that and they keep it pretty limited. and keep it relevant, and so it's just a matter of trying to balance it out because I want to give, the people who read, when I read those kinds of books, I want to learn things too. So I try to mix it in as best I can, and I tell writers all the time, unfortunately, I wish I could tell you how to do it. It's called, it's just practice. You just keep practicing it. You never master it. You just try to get a little better at it each time. Other questions? Questions? Go ahead. Oh, got somebody here? Go ahead. Yeah. How did you find the time to, um, how did you carve out the time to write when you were practicing law? Well, that's, I tell this, when I'm teaching the seminars, writing is a discipline. It is not an obsession. It's a discipline. You have to get a discipline that works for you. Now, for me, I had to practice law and earn a living. So I said, I'm a morning person. I like to work in the morning. So I would get up, I'd go to the office at 6.30 in the morning. I'd work from 6.30 to 9 on the novel. And then I'd practice law. If I had time during the day, if I had some spare time, then I'd work on the book some. But if I didn't, I'd, I had to earn a paycheck. So I had to do that. So, and then I'd research at night before I'd go to bed to get ready for the next day. I still do that to this day. 6.30 to around 11 every day. I still write every morning. So you have to set a discipline that works for you. Bill Deal, the great thriller writer, wrote from midnight to four in the morning because that was his productive time. So you have to find what works for you, set aside the time and do it. Five days a week is what I normally do. I don't work on the weekends even today unless I'm on deadline. The last month I've been on a deadline so I had to work some on the weekends. But I tend not to do a lot on the weekend if I can avoid it. That's usually children or other things that are done then. That's why I say all the time, it is not an obsession, just a discipline. Find what works and make it work for you. Now, by the way, having a job and having a family is no excuse for not writing. It can be done and you can balance it out. It can be done. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, 
first of all, I'd like to preface this question by saying, I, you know, I love to read, I think, particularly your Cotton Malone series, but has there been any talk, interest at all in, in translating the Cotton Malone series into perhaps movies? Because I think it would translate fantastically, really make for a very entertaining film. There's been a, a lot of talk about it, and we get inquiries all the time, but no one has ever come with a check. <laughs> I'm waiting for the person to come and say, I'm here with a check. That will perk my interest up a little bit better. But uh, uh, it'd be great. I wish somebody, I mean, I thought it'd be really nice if it would, but it just hasn't happened yet. We get a lot of inquiry, but no one has actually bought it yet or come down to do it. It takes a while. They make so few movies. It's so few. So it's not unusual. And I'm only on book 10, and most of the folks, it's, you know, 14, 15. It's a lazy end before it happens. Uh, let's see over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I teach eighth graders how to write um, using grammar, but I also give them the opportunity to write novellas to get their voices heard. Yes. One of the biggest problems I have as a writer myself is making my characters three-dimensional. How do you go about doing it so they don't sound artificial. It's hard. It's a struggle for me. Characterization is something I have to really, really, really work on. I have to be very conscious of characterization. It's something that I've always had to struggle with. You want your, one of the things I do is your bad guy should have good qualities and your good guy should have bad qualities. There needs to be a mix. If, you, if your good guy only has all good qualities, he's what we call Dudley Do-Right. I mean, that's what he is. He's a Dudley Do-Right character, and you know, or he's Boris, which was the bad guy there. You know, you got you need a mix, and that's what always makes it a little bit more interesting. So in mine, I always try to have something good about my bad guy. There's a there's a good aspect to him that, in, in the end, you know, doesn't win over, but it's still there that he has to struggle with. And then there's always something struggling with the with the good guys. I mean, Cotton always has something some struggle that he's having to deal with. Each one of the books, uh, Alexander Link dealt with his ex-wife, and Charlemagne dealt with his father, and Venetian dealt with his relationship with Cassiopeia. So each one of them, he's having to struggle with something. And so I, that's how I do it, trying to give them that more of a dimension. Yes, ma'am? I just wanted to let you know, first of all, I'm actually a new Steve Berry writer, or reader. I just started reading not too long ago. I'm Good. actually reading The Temple of Legacy right now. All right, great. Awesome. My question for you is, where do you start your research? When you decide you want to do something, where's the first place you start? As a writer, I never know where to actually First place I do is I get in the car, <laughs> I drive 30 minutes, about 20 minutes north into Jacksonville, and I go to a place called the Chamblin Book Mine. The Chamblin Book Mine is a gigantic used bookstore. It would take you a couple of days to go through it, <laughs> and they have a magnificent history section. And I go up there and I buy about 400 books on the subject that I'm interested in, <laughs> literally. They know when I'm coming, they get the boxes out, we put them down, we fill them up, we take them in the car, I take them home, and I start going through the books, one at a time, one at a time, looking for those nuggets. 75% of what I find in those books I will never use. About a quarter of it I'll use. And I've done that for 20 years. And then when I'm done, I take the books back, I trade them in, they give me credit, and we start again. And I do that, I, I just did that the other day. I took back last year's books and we, halt, we carted them in and they gave me my credit and we started over again. So that's how I start. And then as I begin to, the story begins to formulate and the research begins to zero in, I then begin to uh, look at very specific things and looking at these things. And by then I'm probably started writing the book. So I'm writing and researching at the same time. Occasionally, we have to take a trip, like I talked about. I'll tell you a quick story about a trip to do. Elizabeth doesn't like me to tell this story. <laughs> it's her own fault. Uh, we went to Paris on the Paris Vendetta, and we, our research trips are four days. We, don't, we always set a four-day limit. Uh, we target them. We go in. We spend from 7 in the morning to about 10 at night every day looking at what we're looking for. We get there, and I have to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower because I need to do some scenes up there. We get on the elevator. Have you ever done it? Been on the elevator of the Eiffel Tower? It's all glass, and you, it feels like you're kind of floating. And it's really kind of cool, you know? You go up 900 feet, and you're going up. And we looked over at Elizabeth, and we discovered something about her we never knew. <laughs> she doesn't like heights. Uh, her eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and she is just freaking out. Now, we get to the top of the Eiffel Tower, and she is now in full panic mode. Not afraid. I'm talking about panicky. And, you know, me being the loving husband that I am, I look at her and I say, well, honey, you're just going to have to suck it up because we're up here. 
and I've got to figure out how to kill somebody up here. And the uh, security guard didn't like that too much. He actually spoke English, and uh, we explained to him the problem, and he, he was then very nice, and he sat with her as she curled up in the fetal position on one of the girders. We have some great photos of that, by the way, too. I did a great shift of that. And I did my thing. Now, you might think I was a little insensitive there. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a reason why I did that. Let me tell you the rest of the story. A year earlier, we were in the Ukraine, and we wanted to see these underground caverns where the Nazi resistance fighters hid during World War II. Now, it's 100 feet down and 300 feet into the ground in a thing that's the size of a coffin. It's not like this. It's about this wide. And I had to bend down the whole time in there, no ventilation, few light bulbs, and we discovered something about me. <laughs> I don't like being underground, and I had a panic attack. And what did my wife say? Suck it up, you big baby. <laughs> Where? Now, I paid her back. Yes, I did. <laughs> She got to sit in the open air for an hour at the top of that hotel. I was in a coffin for two hours, because you can't go back. You have to only go forward, and I had to stay down there, and I didn't like it at all. And I will never do that again. We will never go underground, and she will not go up high. So we've learned that. So on research trips, you do discover things about yourselves even sometimes. Other questions? Got a question? Here's one. All right. mentioned writing groups uh, in your with your own input into other people's work do you see yourself as part of the 75 percent or part of the 25 percent hmm. I would like to think that mine was gold now but I'm sure that some of what I said for them was garbage as well yeah so you don't know your own style and you have to discover it you have to discover your style and unfortunately, I was in the group for six years. We never talked about that. We never actually talked about our style. It's just something that you began. Now, we'll have to say, after a while, I began to notice their style, and I knew what not to say, what not to tell them, you know, because I knew they'd never do it. It's not them. So after a while, you begin to do it. But I would imagine the beginning, uh, probably 75% of mine was garbage, too, to them. But you weed it out. And it was very, very good. They were tough on me. They were tough. I was one of the girls. There was four ladies, uh, three ladies and myself. I was the youngest. And I learned about menopause and hormones. I mean, you go to see someone every Wednesday night for six years, you learn a lot about them, okay? And so I was one of the girls with them. And uh, they were really hard on me. And I can still hear their voices in my head when I write every day. I can still hear them. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, how much? tolerance do you give Cotton Malone in all the activities that he goes through? When do you know that he's going to be too much? Well, I, I know his character fairly well because when I created him in the Templar Legacy, I had no idea he was going to get to come around. We wanted him to be a series, but we didn't know it would work, so we didn't have a clue. But I, So I modeled him after me because, you know, it was just quicker to do use me. So he, he kind of thinks like me, acts like me, talks like me. He's, he's me in a lot of ways, so I kind of know where to draw the line. Cotton did something in the Charlemagne pursuit. In fact, he did two things in the Charlemagne pursuit I thought he would never do. Never in a million years. I'm not going to tell you, because give it away for those who know we're ready. But there's two things I thought he'd never do, but he did. And I let, him, he crossed the, I let him cross the line even there, because it fit. It was OK to cross the line with what he did. But uh, they were emotional things. Cotton's not the most emotional guy in the world, as you may, those of you who read the series know. But he's getting more that way. I think that's a little bit of influence of someone in this tent. Her, <laughs> her name is oh, his, Elizabeth does that, yes. Uh, now that you're a writer, do you still have time to read for pleasure? And if you do, who, who are your favorite authors to read? I don't get to read near as much as I used to because uh, I read about 20 books a year for blurbing. That's for other writers that I give them the cover blurbs because people did it for me. Dan Brown did it for me. A lot of folks did it for me, so I, I do it for them. I read for fun. I read Jim Rollins, Lee Child, Baldacci, uh, Cussler. I'm a thriller junkie. That's what I am, you know. Um, uh, Sharon K. Penman, I love historical fiction, so I love her stuff. Uh, Margaret George's stuff, I love her stuff. Uh, 
So I, there's about six or eight that I will read for fun, but it's just there's no time. I'm reading 400 books for research and 20 for blurbing and writing. I used to read about six, five to six books a month. Now it's about six to eight a year. Uh, you, yes, ma'am. Well, thanks for being here. Yes, ma'am. Are the secondary uh, characters? So I was just wondering if maybe we would see more uh, stories centered around them. Yeah, I think one day you might see Sam Collins come back and have his own book. Cassiopeia, uh, there's a lot of talk about giving her her own story all by herself, and that's very possible that could happen one day. I'd like to write a book with a female protagonist. I've never done that, so that would be a, a, a good challenge to do. Uh, I think you will see that. The, the new guy that I created next year, uh, Tom Sagan, if he comes, if you like him, he'll come back. I mean, I wrote him where he could come back and do something. He's not a Cotton Malone kind of guy. He solves his problem in a different way. But he's a very interesting fellow. So I, I think you probably see Sam Collins in Cassiopeia one day. That's very possible, yes. Yes? Sorry to be repetitious, but no. back to the writer's group issue. It's okay. I wrote a book. I finished it. I got it published. Great. The writer's group, for me, was the difference between a voice that just wouldn't stop and desiring to write and an audience that wanted to hear what I wanted to say. <laughs> and that's my question to you. Did you find that the writer's group helped you direct that voice to the audience better, or was that not relevant for you? The writer's group helped me teach me the craft of writing, and I was fortunate that I found a good group. There are bad groups now. I mean, in fact, unfortunately, my experience has been there's a lot more bad groups than there are good groups. These are not uh, where, you know, you take it out, your frustrations on people, because everyone has to take their turn in the front and read their stuff. You just can't go there and complain. You've got to have your turn up there. And you hope that they'll be as honest with you as you are with them. And sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it doesn't. And we had a couple of people enter our group that were not very good to the dynamic, and we asked them to leave because it wasn't working in the dynamic that, that was working. We were very fortunate. We were tolerant of each other. We understood each other's style after a while. We never, ever, ever discussed story. Story has nothing to do with a writer's group, zero. I don't care. We had erotica. We had mystery. We had, we had everything you could think of in there. Doesn't matter. Craft is craft. I don't care what you write. Craft is craft. So we never discussed story in any way. If someone said, I didn't like that story, I didn't care. I mean, we never said that, but if a new person came in, I, don't, I didn't ask you whether you liked my story. I asked you, was it written properly? Have I conveyed it in a proper manner? Have I kept my point of view? Am I tight with my psychic distance? Have I done what I'm supposed to do? That's what I'm interested in to do. And we stuck to that. Now, if a writer's group will stick to those rules, it'll be successful. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you decide on the topics for those 400 books that you referred to? Well, I, I figured, like, for example, next year's book was Christopher Columbus. And I knew I needed to learn about Columbus. And I went to the Chamblin Book Mine, and I literally bought about 100 books on Columbus. Every book he had it, I could find that looked interesting on Columbus, I bought it. And by the way, have you ever read 100 books on the same subject? <laughs> I want to tell you right now, you won't imagine how they conflict with one another. <laughs> There's nothing similar about any of the hundred books. It's, it's, really, it's really very frustrating when you're writing on the same, reading something on the same subject like that. It becomes, I have to make educated guesses after a while. So, you know, I go in and I just pick the books that I think are interesting, that I think will give me what I'm looking for. A lot of them are duds and they go back very quickly. But the, I end up keeping on the shelf 100, 150 during the entire writing of the novel. Yes, sir. Finish the manuscript. What would be probably the next step you would take? After, after you finish the manuscript, the next step is I give it to my editor and my agent. Like right now, they're reading next year's book. I finished it two weeks ago. I'm talking about layman like me. Oh, do I not? If I oh, write one. If you write one. Oh, if you write one, uh, when you're finished and you've got it as perfect as you can get it, then you need to find an agent. You have to get an agent, really, in this world, unless you want to self-publish it or, or do some type of e-publishing. But even then, I'd get an agent, to be honest with you. It's a tough business, and I would recommend you get an agent. And the way I did it, I bought a book called The Guide to Literary Agents. It's put out by Writer's Digest every year. Get it, find all the agents in there in the non-fee-paying section that deal with your genre, and do what it says. I sent out 400 letters, and I got 10 back, 
and one took me, which is a miracle because most times it doesn't. So it's a really tough process to get an agent. But that's what you need. You need an agent. All right? Yes, sir. The last book is the first one of you written that I read and enjoyed it very much. Thank you. My question to you is I really enjoy historical fiction. How do I know what's true and what's not true? Well, in my book, it's real easy because I have a writer's note in the back, and I spend about a week writing that writer's note because I want you to know what's right and what's right. wrong. I don't want to. I don't want you to, to read. You know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are getting their history from novels like mine, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, I'm not a historian, you know, to do, but I try to make it as accurate as humanly possible. So my writer's note is very detailed. So if you don't have a writer's note in the back, unfortunately, you just have to go and do the research to see if it's real. Uh, I, I hate that when I read a book like that and they don't tell me what's real and what's not. It fr frustrates me. So I've always wanted to do it. But please, please, please do not read my writer's note first. It gives away the entire novel. I got cussed out by a lady one day about that, why I had that in the book. But we put it at the end for a reason, so you know you don't read it first. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Oh, yes, sir. You mentioned uh, going to the bookstore after you decided to write on Columbus. Seems to me there's so many mysteries to write about. The Chinese fleet, the Kennewick Man, the Nazca Lines, the Clovis points in Europe and no. eastern United States. How do you decide? I try to find something that no one's ever done. I don't want to do the same thing. Like when I wrote about the lost tomb of Alexander the Great, no one's really done anything with that. When I did the, the Lost Library of Alexandria, I did it through the context of something in the Old Testament that no one's ever touched before. Uh, I, I try to find a concept that's not been used. I don't want to do what someone else has done. And even if someone's done it, I want to do it in a totally different way. Like in the Emperor's Tomb that's here, in the bookstore here, the first uh, uh, Emperor's Tomb in China. It has been touched before in fiction, but not the way I did it. The Emperor's Tomb is really a book about oil that has nothing to do with the Middle East. Nothing at all to do with the Middle East, but it's a book about oil. So I, I try to do something different in a different way so that it'll be unique. Uh, no writer wants to copy someone else, and I certainly don't. That's the last thing in the world I want to do. So I, that's, I struggle with that. I, I have to find something new and different. This thing with Columbus next year, no one has touched it. It's virgin. So um, I'm, I think I'll be the first to touch this one. Thank I, you. I haven't found anybody who's touched it. Let's put it that way. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, I know you, don't I? Yes, you do. <laughs> you do. I do. Thank you. <laughs> I just look out of place. We yes. usually meet in Arizona. We do. We do. Um, character definition. When you're working on a character, how do you do? You pull from from current characters. I, when I found that when I was reading the Jefferson Fleet, I had thought I recognized famous personages, pieces of them that had been woven into different people's characters. When you settle, sit down to write a villain or to write a character. Where do you get your, your people from? Well, that'd be a little bit. Uh, Quentin Hale in the Jefferson Key, he's a pirate. I mean, that's what he is. He's a modern-day pirate. And, and there's a little bit of historical character, a little bit of that in there. You were astute to pick that up. There is a little bit of that in there from a historical angle of some of the historical pirates. I put the way they think and the way they thought because they're pretty much an anomaly today. So I, uh, I did do that. I look for that. Uh, creating bad guys is tough because... After you do it, I've done it now ten times, and you know you 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 don't want to repeat yourself. You know you've got you got to do different. It's got to be a different kind of bad guy each time. And so I try to look for something, and I look to history to help me with that. Yeah. So you're saying that one of the things that you're you're very careful of is is make to make sure that you don't repeat yourself. Yet if you're reading other other crime writers, and you're reading um, Rollins, and you're reading Pinder, and you're re read Finder, and you're reading all these people. How can you ensure that any elements of your plot hmm? didn't somehow creep in from an element of their plot? Just careful. I mean, I'm careful about that. I don't. I read their stuff, but I, I, I can honestly say never once. I, I will say this: I steal style all the time. I mean, we steal each other's style constantly. I learned. I repl I, I replotted my entire novels after reading The Da Vinci Code. Uh, if you read The Third Secret and you read The Templar Legacy, you'll see the books plotted completely differently. The difference is I read Da Vinci between those two. So we, we steal style from each other constantly of technique of how to do things, but never plot or character or anything like that. We're very, I'm very careful about that. Uh, if I get anything that I think is even close, I'll call them uh, to do. Jim and I particularly will sometimes 
get real close to one another. And we don't really compare notes. It's really accidental. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question. Sure, you're right. And, and that is, you're talking about plotting the novel. Do you, a lot of writers say, well, you know, I sit down and it comes and the characters form and I write them as I go. Do you write as you go or do you sit down and draw out what's going to happen and then write to I've never had. I've never understood that when a writer says they sit down and I have no idea what I'm doing, it just sort of comes. <laughs> what an incredible waste of time. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how could you possibly just sit down? I mean, I've sat in front of that word processor for 20 years and I can assure you it never just comes out of nowhere. You know, you have to think about it. So I plot about 50 pages ahead of myself. So I stay always about 50 pages ahead of where I'm going so that when I sit down to write each morning, I'm not sitting there staring at the screen. I actually know where I want to go. Now, does it change as I'm writing? Absolutely. All the time. That's the cool part, that it changes as it does. But as far as just sitting down and having no clue, not a good idea. Thank you, ma'am. One more question. Yes, ma'am? I'm curious how your experience as a divorce attorney has influenced your writing? <laughs> well, if you read the Alexandria link, there's a lot of it in there because <laughs> it dealt with Cotton and Pam who are divorced, so there's a lot of actual conversations in there uh, to do that I, uh, that I did experience over the years. But it really hadn't. I would say that what being a divorce lawyer made me write the thrillers I write because I wrote them to escape that world. If you're listening to that, Every day, all the time, you just, it, you, you'll blow your brains out after a while. I mean, you got to do something, you know. It's too much coming at you. It's too depressing. You're seeing people at their worst, their absolute worst, and they can't help it. They're at their worst. Their emotions are down. We've all been there. But, you know, I started writing thrillers to get away from that. And so I think that's what it was for me. It was an escape. And that's what a thriller is, isn't it? It's simply an escape. And when someone comes up to me and says, you know what? I sat down with your book. I read it for a few hours. And I forgot my troubles. That's the finest compliment I can possibly be given. Because that's what I set out to do, to, for, to, to forget the troubles. And if it works for, you, work for me and it works for you, that's great. So I appreciate y'all coming. Thank you so much. It's great being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.